Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come before you tonight, and we thank you so much, Father God, allowing us to come back into your house, Lord. And I ask the Lord, you open up every ear to what you want them to hear through your word. And so we thank you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our foundational scripture will be Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. This evening's message, message is on Noah walking with God. Our world today is sending out conflicting messages. Suicide rates at an all-time high. The legalization of drugs is having a tremendous effect on society. The murder rate is out of control. Marriages are falling apart. And our kids are looking for answers and they don't know where to look. Our juvenile facilities and prisons are being overcrowded. There's a certain part of our society that wants us to believe it's just our imagination running away with us. Many churches are preaching a watered down gospel and message. In the words of the great R&B singer Marvin Gaye, what's going on? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctoring. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great numbers of teachers to say, what their itching ears wants to hear. They would turn their ears away from the truth of God's word and turn aside to myths and fables. No wonder Christians are looking to politicians for the answer instead of Jesus Christ because they don't want to hear the truth of God's word. I have read many times through my Bible. I never read about a Republican, a Democrat, or an independent Christian. Yet these worldly issues come into our churches and cause division within the body of Christ. God warns us about these times and the things that would be happening in these times just before his return. He made it very clear through five words in the days of Noah. We should be living as Noah was living in those days. He was living and walking by faith. That message was so powerful that even Matthew, in the book of Matthew, he quoted these words. Matthew 24, verses 37 and 39. But as in the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Whereas in the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving unto marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. 
and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So will it be when the Son of Man comes. Now Noah was a man of faith and obedience. In our foundation of scripture in Hebrews chapter 7 it reads, by faith Noah being divinely warned of things yet not seen. He moved with godly fear prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heirs of righteousness, which is according to faith. The first thing Noah did was he moved in acts of obedience, being divinely warned of things not seen. Noah was able to hear the voice of God. He didn't see the things that God had spoke about these things to come. He just moved by an act of obedience because he was divinely warned. That means God spoke to him. Faith is activated by your works of obedience. God says, take, if you take one step, and if you don't move, that's disobedient. See, anyone can say they have faith, but how can you tell if a person has faith or not? Because their feet or your feet or my feet will move towards the promises of God. How many times have you heard a, a Christian say, God doesn't love me. God doesn't care anything about me. When he speaks and he talks to us, and if we don't move by faith, then we won't hear until we move. And as many times we know that God has spoken to us, it's usually after we do something. Right? If he told you by faith that you don't have that much money, and you, bought, and you go out and buy a car anyway, Six months you can't make the payments? He told you. If he told you not to marry that person and you married that person, the question is, how do you look now? Do you know it's possible to have a dried of faith? A dried of faith it's like a drive-by Christian. What does a drive-by Christian look like? A drive-by Christian is someone that, even before the service starts, you're looking at your watch, wondering what time the service is over with. Wondering what time the preacher is going to stop preaching. Because God has a message for you, but you don't have time. See, that process starts for you, and the process starts for me with our prayer life, spending time with God, meditating on the Word of God. It's a devotional life. And sitting under the Word of God as we sit tonight will illuminate our faith. In the book of James, he speaks about it very clearly. 
James chapter 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Faith without works is dead. That means your faith is dried up. Because it's obedience, number one, to what God has told you to do, and you're stepping out on faith. It's the work of obedience that ignites our faith. That you see the invisible enter into the visible. That's what faith does. It grabs the invisible and brings it to the visible. And we can read that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and that's the word of God. As I've been told, it's all, almost over 3,000 promises in the word of God. The substance is the word of God. It's the things to hope for, that all the things that Christ has spoken to us. We have the hope of heaven, even though we have not seen heaven, we have that hope through the word of God. It's the evidence of things not seen. Each and every person in this room has a changed life. See, God was always reaching out to us, but we weren't reaching out to him. We were living a total different life. But we see the evidence of the truth of God's word. Before we came to Christ, there were many that told us about this God. There were many that told us about how our lives can be changed and have meaning. But now we see the promises of God's word through the evidence. Because we sit here tonight listening to God's word and standing on his promises in his word. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Also says in his word that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Back to our foundational verse in Hebrews 11, 7. By faith, nor being designedly worn of things not yet seen, move with godly fear, preparing an ark to save his household, by which he condemned the world and became heirs of righteousness, which is according to faith. Noah's obedience activated his faith to hear the word of God. You know, Things have happened in and through our lives and when we pray about it or have someone else pray about it and you know that it's by the grace of God that that prayer was answered. And we know that as we live the righteous life through, through God's righteousness and grace, as Noah was obedient, his face was activated to hear the voice of God. Isn't it so exciting when you know that God has spoken to you about something? That always increases our faith. Noah moved by preparing an ark for his whole family. And his whole family got saved according to faith. We are told about Noah and Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. 
This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. One thing we, we learn here, the first thing we learn about Noah is that he was a righteous man. He lived to please God. Can we say that? That we live to please God. Every step that we make, every decision, every thought, can we say that we live to please God? We also found out that he was a blameless man and he had integrity with the people. Now, the reason why Noah was deemed a righteous and blameless man had to do with his walk with God. See, our walk with God is very important to walk with God. See, most Christians want God to walk with them. Now, that's backwards. We got some Christians walking in front of God. We got some Christians walking in the back of God. We got some Christians walking sideways with God. But God wants you and me to walk with him. In other words, Noah and God was on the same page. And when we walk with God, then he is always included and invited in every decision that we make in our lives. Let's look at the context. Let's look at the, the context when Noah was walking with God. It says in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. And the daughters were born to them, the sons of God. The sons of God saw the daughters of men and they were beautiful. And they took wise for themselves and all whom they had chose. Verse 3, the Lord says, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent, every thought of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have made from the face of the earth. Both man and beast, creeping things, birds of the air, for I'm not sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now Noah was walking in a culture when nobody else were walking with God. He was totally out of the step with what was going on in the world. We're told about the world that it had begun to become wicked. What was some of the wickedness that was going on? 
If you look into the scriptures, you will see immorality, violence, lewdness, vulgarity, profanity, lying, killing, blasphemous, blasphemous. <laughs> then it hit the bottom, demon possession. The sons of God cohabitated with the daughters of men. In other words, fallen angels. The fallen angels are sexless, entering to evil men, having relationships with women, producing a demonized population. When you tell your kids they're acting like a demon, you might be true. This population that had infiltrated by demons tells us that every thought, every thought of man was against God. See, our world today they don't believe that. Now, the reason that your walk with God will be different than in past generations is because we are dealing with a demonized environment. Evil infiltrating Mankind, so that demonic activity is dominating our environment. That's why you get up some mornings and you turn on the news or you look at Facebook, you look at whatever you want to look at, wondering what's going on. Those of us that have been on the earth for quite some time, we can see the different changes in the many different generations. You know that the Lord is coming back because he said these things will happen as his return draws near. And the reason we know that evil is infiltrating our environment because the people are coming up with new ways to do evil. If you listen to the news like I listen to the news at times, some of the things you can't believe what human beings can do to other human beings. That's demonic. But here was the culture. Here was the environment that Noah found himself walking in. In other words, Noah was the odd man out. Don't you feel that way at work sometimes? Do you feel that way at family functions? You're a Christian, but you're the odd, you're the odd man out. Noah was a crazy man. Anybody call you crazy for being a Christian? They call him he's a crazy man because what? He would not conform to the culture. See, if you do not conform to this culture, you're the odd man out. Because you're a Christian. Nobody wants to live that way. Because you have no, they have no relationship with God, so they don't understand. See, Noah took a stand in life, and we must take a stand in life also. See, Noah did not want to be popular with the world. He wanted to please God. That should be our attitude to please God. See, when you live in a world that Noah lived in the world that we live in today, that's pressure. A lot of you that go to work and you're going to go to work tomorrow and you're going to be under pressure. 
The environment is squeezing you every day. You go to work and you might be one or two Christians in the whole building and you hear your co-workers talking. They say, oh, yeah, we went to the party last night. It was popping off. You know, I was, you know, we just having a good time. The drinks were flowing, and I mean, we were just partying. We had a good time. Then they ask you, what did you do this weekend? I went to church. What, what, what? I went to church. Speak up. I, I went to church. I feel sorry for you. See, they don't understand. See, the only reason why your voice was barely audible because you had a moment. Maybe you had a moment when you used to carouse the streets. Maybe you had a moment when you used to live like them. Maybe things came back in your mind at that moment because it can happen that quick. And then all of a sudden they see you. They know you're a Christian. But they got to ask you anyway, what you do this weekend? You can't even make a noise. Like, church. You know, what? Church. You know what I mean? Like you went to the boringest place in the world. Now that's pressure. See? Once again, we're feeling like what? The odd man out. You're always going to be the odd person out when you're walking with God. Now, we're in a good environment right now, right? Everybody's in a Christian, right? We're all Christians in here. There's no, there's no competition in this room, right? Everybody here on the same page. We got the Bible open, we listen to the Word, and we are agreeing, right? Even if you don't agree, you're going to fake it. You're going to fake it. He, you know, well, whatever he says, you know, I'm with it. I don't agree with it, but we're all Christians in here, and I don't want to be the odd man out, even though I'm a Christian. If you go into water and you go deep enough, you will get lockjaw. You want to be able to open your mouth. But because the deeper you go, the more pressure you feel. If a boat goes down too far, into the water, the pressure will collapse the boat because of too much pressure. That's except if you are a submarine. See, a submarine can get to the bottom of the ocean because in a sub, it's pressurized. So it can go down to the deep, despite of the pressure. Because when they pressurize a submarine, there is more pressure on the inside than the pressure coming at it from the outside, which is able to sustain itself in the pit of the darkness in the ocean. But if you go really deep and there's no pressure on the inside, the pressure on the outside will flatten like a pancake. The reason why so many Christians are collapsing because there's not enough walking with God on the inside. Noah walked so close to God that he was the only one God was talking to. He said, Noah, it's going to rain. Noah, I'm going to destroy the earth. Now, nobody else heard that. God was telling Noah what he's going to do. And Hebrews 11 says, Seven tells us what? He was what? Warned by God. And the reason why some of us don't hear from God because we are 
walking too far. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 11 and 20, it says that the earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Verse 13 said, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover the inside and outside with pitch. So Noah's listening to all of this. So God is telling Noah, I want you to build this boat. Has God ever told you something that don't make sense? This doesn't make sense to Noah. But he tells Noah what? I'm going to destroy the world. And I want you to build a boat. Now, I don't know about you. Because I go before the throne of God and praying and trying to figure out what God is telling me. You know, when he tells you something that don't make sense. I think that's something we should act upon. As he tells Noah, as he says, here, I want you to build this boat. Let's bring it into context. No, he never seen a flood. He never saw rain. Up until this point, because the earth was water from what? Underneath. Underneath the ground. That's how the earth was water. God is warning him about something he had never seen. As we spend time with God and learn how to hear his voice, he will direct and guide us. As we see with Noah. Now, according to historians, there's between 6 to 12 billion people on the earth. And God is only speaking to one person. Now, what do you think about that? All the people on the earth. And God can only find one righteous man. And God is speaking to him. God is telling him the things that have came, come before him. And, and this, this one man that, that God is speaking to. That God is preparing something in his life. When God is speaking to you, he is preparing you for something in your life. Most of us stay within the moment. Most of us stay where we're comfortable. God doesn't work like that. When God speaks to us, it's all for our good. And that's what we see here in Noah. Nor never seen a flood, never seen rain, never seen it. But God begins to warn him about something that he had never, ever seen before. Now, this boat that God was commanding Noah to build was one and a half football fields long, four stories high. And it took them 120 years to build it. Ain't that something? 120 years, ain't nobody going to be here that's in the room right now. You be gone. In 120 years. But Noah was faithful in what God had called him to, to do. Some of you have been waiting for answer prayer for a long time. <laughs> and you haven't seen it rain yet. But imagine, 120 years, 
It says in Genesis 6, 22, thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, and so he did. Wow, I wish that was my name. I wish that was me. God speaking to me, everything. Yes, Josh, yes, Josh, I got you, I got you, Lord. But Noah, by God's command, he did so. You know what we do? We do some of what God tells us. We don't do it all. We do some of it, what God tells us. To walk by faith is to what? Complete what God tells us to do. That's walking by faith. See, Not part of what God is telling us to do. To complete what God tells us to do. Noah exercised his first step of faith when he cut down the first gopher wood tree. That's what he did. Step down. God says, it's going to rain. He want me to build a boat. I'm going to go out here and cut this tree down with my chainsaw. No, he didn't have a chainsaw. <laughs> Got his axe out. And he spent 120 years obeying God without seeing anything. Now, ain't that something? Some of y'all pray for five seconds and wonder why God ain't showed up. A hundred and twenty. Can you imagine that? Don't you think Noah got tired? People coming around laughing at you. Noah, what you doing? Chop, 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 chop. You know? And that's what he did. See, sometimes we get tired. Sometimes we give up. But Noah was what? A righteous man, a man of integrity, a man that God had chosen, a man that God had poured his grace upon. I know the tired, Noah got tired. I believe there were days that Noah had doubt in his life. But he kept on building. He kept on standing on the promises of God. You know what 2 Peter 2, 5 tells us about Noah? Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Noah was just chopping in the day, just chopping down trees during the day and going in town at night preaching. He's preaching. He only had a three-word service. He only had a three-word sermon. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. They say, Noah, what is rain? No, I said, I don't know. God told me it's going to rain. And that's what it is. He worked in the daytime and preached at night. That's what he did for 125 years. That's what Noah did. He's faithful to do that. Witnessing for Christ. And that's what we should do. See, if you're praying and being obedient and doing the work of God, you don't have to worry about when God's going to answer because you're walking by faith. Noah just didn't do one thing, just chop trees all day. Noah couldn't wait. Is it Sunday night? It's Sunday night, right? You should be, ex you hear Sunday, you should be excited for next Thursday. So you can come back and hear the word of God, right? Well, some of y'all excited, just go to work tomorrow. That's where Noah was. He was always excited. Because why? He had his eyes on God. It says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 18. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Men, Noah's relationship with God transferred over to his family. His faith had an impact on them, and they saw his obedience. You ever notice his, his family is not mentioned? 
as Noah started to do the work of God, they was right there by his side, working. That's how godly families should be. Man should accept the example for his family, and then they're going to come along beside him and help him with the work of God. That's the impact that Noah had on his family. Men, God has called us to be leaders of our homes. Our children shouldn't be going and asking our wives about answers to Bible questions. We should have the answer. We should be leaders as Noah led his family. The outside world was trying to pull him. But they saw him working and worshiping, preaching and trusting God. You know, that's what ministries do. Mission trips do. We're serving God and we're going out sharing the word of God, seeing God change in lives. That's how God works in our lives, constantly doing the work of the Father. And that's what Noah did. When things get hard in your life, sometimes, maybe sometimes, all you can do is sing a hymn. But you're singing in the God, right? You know, when you was out there in the world, you probably were singing everything, right? Things you shouldn't even be singing. You were singing. But when things got hard, As Noah was working, he was worshiping, sharing, preaching the word of God, standing what God had told him that it was going to rain. And family, that's the way our lives should look like. Men and women of God. When God gave the command To go into the ark, all follow, because he walked with God. You know what else followed Noah in in, in the ark? You got lions, you got giraffes, you got birds. I don't know, frogs, they were all following. They saw this righteous man. Now, Noah didn't go tell the animal, man, it's going to rain. The animal knew something was up. They had been watching Noah build an ark for 120 years. They said something was happening. They, they knew something was happening because they never seen nothing like that. You know, Noah was building. They were jumping through the windows and all that stuff saying, I know. And, and Noah building little rooms and stuff. Oh, my goodness. They was obedient. You know, was, you know what else was amazing? Where did he get the food from? God provided the food. Yeah. God provides, God provides everything when you're trusting in the Lord. And so when he gave the command, that's when the things start to happen. Now, we got another character in the Bible. We're not going to talk about him too long. His name was Lot. You know, God told Lot, he finished destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but Lot showed such a bad example. They had to drag him out. The angels had to drag him out. You know, he was such a bad man that his wife turned around. She turned us off. See, Noah wasn't like that. Noah was a man of God. And then all of a sudden, after 120 years, water started to come down from the sky. Bloop, 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 bloop. Oh, that's rain. You know what Noah told his family? It's time to leave. It's time to leave. Now, he never saw rain, remember that? But when it started blipping from the sky, you know it was time to go. And so Noah told his family, it's time to leave. Noah was given instructions, not even knowing how God was going to pull it off. 
And that's how God wants us to live our lives. Sometimes when things go, God let things happen in our lives, we got questions for God. You know, I do prison ministry and inmates were saying, well, why did God put me here? I said, why are you asking God? Why do you ask the devil why he put them handcuffs on you? See, they don't have no questions for the devil. But they sure got no questions for God. You need to be thankful he put you in because you might be dead. But they don't have any questions for the devil. There's always questions for God. See, God might not give us all the information at one time, but do the work of obedience until he shows you. That's why Noah is one of the great historians in the Bible. A man that found grace in the eyes of God among 60 billion, 12 billion people. That's a whole lot of people. But how many people did God save out of that generation? Only eight. That should tell you something about the righteousness of God. See, Noah never had a problem. Because why? He built a relationship with God. And that's what God wants from us. See, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. And when you have a relationship with someone, you get to know them. See, Noah was always hanging out with God. The generation was telling them to hang out with us. But Noah said, no, 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 no. That's what they was calling him. No, no. He went for no stuff. That was Noah. But he hung out with God. And when the rain began to come down, now you know, when Noah stepped on, on faith, it says that when Noah started building that boat, it was 100 miles from water. That make you question. But Noah never did. But it became very clear that one man was right and the civilization was wrong. You got people questioning your faith. All the time. The world is turning to be what? Anti-God, anti-Christian. You believe in that mumble jumble stuff? Well, you hear it all the time. Because no hurry. But he says, he was right, and the civilization was wrong. It took a while. And I know that some of us get tired in our Christian walk. So you got to keep it real. Some of us get tired in our Christian walk. It's at times we want to give up. But you ask yourself the question, what are you going to go back to? Because the reason why you came to God, because your life was, you had problems in your life. You had issues in your life, and you tried to correct your life. And you kept finding yourself failing over and over and over again. So what do we go back to? See, the enemy always wants us to go back. He always wants to tell you how good things were, right? But he don't tell you when you almost committed suicide. He don't tell you that one. He don't tell you you was drunk laying in the streets and almost got ran over. He don't tell you that. He wants to pull you back to what he calls the good times. He's never going to tell you when you was an enemy of the cross, you could have went straight to hell. He's not going to tell you that. So we do get tired. But you do like Noah. You just sing a song. You do like Noah. You go share the gospel. You do like Noah. You stay close to God. See, there is coming a day when God would make it very clear for those who are standing with him to let them know that he's standing with you.
In Luke 17, verses 26 to 27, as it was written in the days of Noah. You know, we got a good God. You know that? He's always reminding us that he's coming back. In the days of Noah, it's a reference. Because you can't say, I didn't know. I, I had no idea. I had no clue. I got to get ready. But as Luke said, as it was in the days of Noah. Notice, plural, days. As we continue to see the events go on in this world that indicates the closeness and the nearness of God as it was in the days of Noah. It says, also, it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. Once again, he goes back to remind us what he said, and they were eating. They were drinking. They were marrying wives. They were giving into marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. In other words, they were doing whatever they want to do. That's what they were doing. And they're doing it today. Ain't nothing going to happen. We just going to live. That's why we need to get the gospel out. We have our millennials that don't even know what's going on. They go to these big universities and, you know, they're getting taught by these professors that are atheists and all other things that go on. And they don't have this view of life about this God that we serve and that he's coming. These things are coming and this is the world and environment that we live in today. We are living in those days. And in closing, turn to Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. See, God wants to hear from his people. See, God wants to hear from those that he died on the cross from, for. He wants to hear. He wants to hear from those that he gave everything for. He wants to hear. This is serious business here, what he's talking about here. Not only did he warn us seven times, even in the Old Testament, back to the New Testament, as he reminds us about the days of Noah, he says here in 2 Chronicles 7, 4, he says a scripture so very well quote it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive them of their sins. He's saying my people. Those that he has shed in his blood on Calvary's cross from. He wants to hear from his people. See, God always wants to participate in the work. See, some of us want God to do everything. And you, some of you know, your parents know, if you do everything for your kid, I ain't going to do nothing but wait for you. But God is calling out right now for his people who are called by my name will, will humble themselves. See, Jesus humbled himself and gave up everything when he came from heaven. He didn't have to be beaten for us. He could have called a legion of angels. That's 6,000 angels. One angel can kill 185,000 men, but he gave it all for us. That's why his example is humbling yourselves. Pray, seek my face, and turn from your wicked ways. Remind me of Joshua. Chapter 24, verse 15. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. See, Joshua made a statement. See, he didn't go around and, and get up an opinion poll and ask me, you know, what you think or what, what this congregation think or what this. He didn't ask for an opinion poll. He didn't. He just made a decision. 
And that's what we have to make a decision, turn from our wicked ways. And God's promise, then he will hear from heaven and forgive them of their sins. See, Noah was a righteous man. He lived to please God. He was a blameless man. He had integrity with the people. The reason he was righteous and blameless had to do with his walk with God. God always wants to hear from his people. If we are waiting for a political party to heal this land, you can just forget it. Only God can heal this land. And he wants to hear from his people. He wants to hear the cries of his people so he can hear from heaven. May you and me today become that people. Let us become the knowers that God can just look down from heaven and says, yes, those are my people. I speak to them. They obey me. They find pleasure in them. Let's bow our heads and pray. We have the pastors come forward. Father God, in your name, as we come before you now, we want to just want to thank you so much, Lord, for your word. And as we come before you, Father God, this evening, Lord, we want to just thank you, Lord, for all that you do in and through our lives, Lord. We want to thank you so much for your word, Lord, your example, Lord, of encouragement, Lord, for a man like Noah. A man, Father God, was righteous, righteous in a crooked and perverse world, Lord. Even though, Father God, he was the odd man out, Lord. He was obedient, Lord. Even though, Father God, he never saw rain. He never saw a flood. But, Father God, he trusted in your word, Lord. And so tonight, Father God, as I pray with your people, Lord, I ask, Father God, that you would just touch him, Lord. That you would just minister to them, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.